remember, as the mission is being executed, vision is being realized, belong, believe, and behave. What I'd like to do, um, if you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. We'll be reading verses 57 through 62. That's where I'm going to focus on today. Again, that's the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. When you have it, if you let me know by saying amen. All right, some of y'all got it. Some of y'all still looking for Luke. What I'd like to do is read the text as is my custom, give you the title of my sermon, and then pray and we'll walk this out. Is that all right? Amen, amen, amen. Once again, it's the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. And the Bible reads as thus. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And the text states in verse 57, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you. Somebody say, I will follow you. Wherever you go. Amen. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Beloved, pray with me on this morning as we consider the sermonic theme, are you in or are you out? And I'd like to subtitle that, to be or not to be, a radical disciple for Christ. Amen? All right, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come under the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. God, thanking you that you have such a sweet, sweet presence in this place. God, we're thankful for all the membership and the fellowship of Restoration Christian Fellowship. God, we're thankful, God, for the leadership. God, we're thankful for where you're taking this church and this body. God, today we submit ourselves to you and say, challenge us, Father. Father God, rip up the stony ground of our hearts, Lord God, but let there be good seed that the word might take root in the name of Jesus. And then, God, I pray, Father, that you would sit me down in the name of Jesus, God, and that the real preacher would stand up, Father, for when Jesus comes, God, lives are saved. God, when Jesus comes, we are redeemed. God, when Jesus comes, we are made better. So, Father, we turn this service over to you. We tell you, have thine own way. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. It is in your holy Son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. And let everyone here under the sound of my voice say, amen. Amen? Amen. Beloved, y'all a little quiet. That's all right. That's all right. This is number two, so we're going to have to be careful. We're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 and 60 through 62. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, as it relates to this text, you don't mind if I give you my testimony this morning, do you? It, now, now, if I give you my testimony, I can be transparent, right? Y'all not going to judge me. All right, all right, that's cool. Okay, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Um, so, so I've been preaching um, about 12 or 13 years now, um, accepting my calling 12 or 13 years ago. Um, and, and inside of accepting my calling, um, you know how it goes. You end up in church, um, and then you have a desire to get saved, and then all of a sudden you're ready to start doing work for, for the Father. And so the first thing I did was, you know, I was in church, and I got saved, right? So the story goes, I'm going to expand this a little bit from what I did in the first service. The story goes, God tells me, Rashid, uh, it's time for you um, to, to, to have relationship with me. And I'm going, okay, God, sounds wonderful. But I'm saying to myself, but I, I need to clean myself up, up first. I'm not really where I should be. Um, and so I say, God, you know, well, if, if, if you show me, then I'll come up. And so God says, okay, he had the whole church, the pastor that was preaching at the time, had the whole church stand up. The whole church stands up, and he says, for all of you that know, when you leave out of here, if you got hit by a bus on today, and this was going to be your last day on earth, if you know that you know that you're going, sit down. 
Now, I distinctly remember Doc laughing at the Lord. You got to be kidding me. It ain't, I'm not the only one here that ain't sure that I'm going. I, I, I'm looking at y'all. Y'all are a holy crowd. I'm so thankful to be in front of so many Christians that are on their way to heaven. Y'all are angels in my face, so therefore I get to preach to the heavenly beings. That's what's up. I say, God, sure. Okay, you know, this should be easy. It's going to be at least 10 of us. No, the whole doggone church sat down except for me. So now I'm sitting like, now I'm the only heathen up in here. Okay, that's fine, Jesus. I can't believe you put me on blast like that. But that's okay. You said it was something we needed to do. So uh, I go up to, to, to the front, and, and the pastor says to me, he said, man, you're the only brother that stood up. You must have some stuff that, that you need to get rid of. I just looked at the brother, and he said, no. He said, well, go ahead. He gave me the mic. He said, tell the church uh, what, what you need to be delivered from and how you want to restore and change your life for Christ. And I looked at the brother, and, and before he gave me the mic, I looked at him and said, I don't know you like that. What I look like in here? I'm going to sit here, put myself on blast, throw myself up under the bus, tell y'all what I'm struggling with. No. That's not what I'm going to do. So he said, so, brother, what do you need to change? I said, well, I just got some things I need to change. And either you can deal with that or you can't. And that was how I got saved. So that's just me in the beginning of it. And then, then I, you know, I, I, I got to a place where I, I felt God calling me to preach. And so I accepted my calling to preach. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I kind of looked like this text. I said, God, I'm going to preach. I'm going to go ahead and I'll be who you called me to be. And so I put my hands to the plow, so to speak. And I put my hands to the, cloud, to the plow, beloved, and, and, and the problem was is that I had a propensity for turning back. Huh? Oh, okay, let, let, let me go ahead and bring that down so you understand what I'm talking about. I, I put my hands to the plow, and I said, I'm going to go ahead and preach the gospel, and I'm going to be all God said I was going to be, but like y'all said, I can be transparent, right? I accepted a calling when I had addictions. Okay. And so I put my hand to the plow, and I had no problem preaching. I had no problem doing things in church. But when I walked out of a place that looked like this, I was going to the liquor store because I had some things that I needed to do for me as well. I, I, I know that's nobody in this church, and that's, and that's fine with me. I told the first service, I said, I wasn't just going to get me, a, you know, a beverage. Can we call it a beverage in here? Y'all be all right. I wasn't just going to get a beverage, but as I told him in the first service, I was going to get some stuff that's now legal in Colorado, but it was illegal back then. But I still knew how to get my hands on it. I'm just saying, I had my hand to the plow. I was looking back. And I was conflicted. As it related to my walk with Christ, and, and, and so I looked schizophrenic to people. And so therefore, there were some people that I didn't even want to minister to because I was scared they were going to look at me like I should be a reject. I'm just saying, that was my testimony. That was my testimony. Some of us, we sometimes have, have been called to do some stuff, and we know that, you know, there's some things that we want to do for Christ, but we feel like we have to clean ourselves up first, or we're worried about putting our hands to the plow while we're still attached to some things that shouldn't be there. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that place where you hear God calling you? You hear God saying it's time to do something else, but you say, God, I can't do it because I want to put my hand to the plow, but I don't think you're going to be able to keep me. Let's walk into the text. Let's walk into the text. So we're, we're, we're working with uh, verses 57 through 62. However, I must give you a little background as it relates to the text. This is uh, Luke, obviously the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. Um, and we see around verse 51. So that's, well, is that where we had Jesus? It is 51. Okay, I just wanted to check. Y'all all right with that. Uh, around verse 51, um, we see a transition in the text. Amen? We see a transition in the text. And we now see what is commonly called by scholars, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Does that make sense? Okay, so the section as it relates to chapter 9, it focuses on the disciples and their failures and their successes. Amen? So let's read. Let's start with verse 51, and then let's walk out this text. I won't be in front of you long. Verse 51 says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face, he set his face, it also can be translated as he resolved. He resolved to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. Listen to this part, verse 53 says, but the people did not receive him. Because his face was set toward Jerusalem, and when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? 
But he turned, Jesus turned and rebuked them, them being James and John, not the people from Samaria, James and John, and they went on to another village. We see rejection of the Lord in Samaria, rejection of the Lord, and, and, and we see immediately the disciples say, let's go on and put fire down on them. Let's consume them and let's kill them all. <laughs> y'all, 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 y'all quiet. Y'all quiet on this. Y'all quiet on this because you act like that there's never been a time in your life where you've been rejected. That there's never been a time in your life where you've been preaching Jesus to somebody and they rejected you and you immediately said, you know what, bump you. Go on ahead. I hope something happens to you. That's a gentle way of saying that, right? It's a gentle way of saying, I hope you go to H-E double hockey sticks. I'm just saying, I know I'm not the only one in this place that when I've done work for God and somebody said, I'm not with that. And I was like, well, you know what? The text does say if you go back up earlier in chapter 9, just shake the dust from your feet. But I was doing more than just shaking the dust from my feet. I wanted something to happen to them. Y'all playing? That's fine. That's fine. Y'all holy right now. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. But, but it's interesting because Jesus refuses to do this refuses to send judgment. And, and there are scholars that say the reason why Jesus refused to send judgment on them because now at this point in his ministry was not the time for judgment, but it was time for hope. Can you hear that? It was time for hope and not time for judgment. I'm so thankful that God gave me time. To get into the kingdom. Oh, okay, see, y'all super holy in here. See, now, now there was a time in my life where I was doing stuff where I deserved everything, including H-E double hockey sticks. I was doing way too much, and I'm so glad that when I look back over my life and I see what the Lord has brought me through, that he gave me time, he gave me hope, he gave me murpy, mur mercy and a purpose. Some of y'all in here need to recognize that, that God is not coming at this point in time for judgment, although judgment will come at hand at some point, but he's giving you time and hope. Yeah. Disciples, the disciples, they, 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 they couldn't see that. They, they, they couldn't see that because it was radical for them. This was radical. We're talking about radical discipleship. This was radical for them because when we're talking about the word Messiah, if you think about it, well, not if you think about it, let me help you with that. In the Old Testament, uh, the Messiah was looked at as somebody that was coming to return the kingdom back to the Israelites. Do you agree? So in seeing that, when the, when the people of the New Testament were looking at who the Messiah was going to be, they were looking for two things. One was a royal Messiah came from the line of David. One was a king, amen. The other was a priestly Messiah, amen, from the tribe of Levi. Levi, the problem is, is they were looking for a God of war, and Jesus shows up, and he's not given judgment, but he's given grace, and they're going, what kind of man is this? But come on, y'all, let's be honest. Don't we do that? Come, come, okay, okay. Come on. Um, when we look at the people of Samaria, when we look at this historically, we understand that the people of Samaria were considered dogs by the Jews. Amen? You understand that through the text? They look at them as dogs. They looked at them as half-breeds, as mixed people. Uh, um, I get that sometimes. Look, y'all don't know what to do with, me, do with me, do you? Well, we don't know if that brother's black. If he's mixed, both my parents are black. I'm just saying, sometimes... <laughs> you can face rejection from your own people. I'm going to keep going. Um, but, but they were considered as dogs. They were considered unworthy. And so ultimately, it seems as though that the Samaritans, for, for the Israelites, or for James and John in particular, it was easier to reject them than others. Are y'all not sitting here telling me that there ain't some people in your life where it's easier for you to reject them? Huh? Because of what they look like? or how they operate, or how they look. I mean, I, I know because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm as young as I feel. I'm not as young as I look. But what I'm saying is, is that there are some people that we consider millennials, amen, and they walk into the church, and they have a certain level of dress, and they have a certain level of swag in the way they carry themselves. And it's sometimes easy for us that are traditional Christians to reject them because they don't look like us. Huh? There's, some of y'all got that uncle that comes to the picnic, and he always got a bottle with him. And y'all so sick of Uncle Larry, but y'all, you hear me? There's some people it's just easier to reject. <laughs> I'm not telling on myself. I don't think I have an Uncle Larry. If I do, I'm glad that brother's not here. But 
<laughs> we got to understand um, that, that, that God gives time, and sometimes it's easier for us to reject others um, that don't look like us or don't, that don't match the creed that we necessarily profess. Amen? And that's a problem. Because I think we can see in, in closing up verses 51 uh, through 56, ultimately that uh, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, rejection is coming. Do you hear me? It's part of the walk that we walk. Rejection is part of this walk. Why? Because we're a peculiar people. We're not of the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. And so when the, when the world looks at us, they're not always going to accept the Jesus that you preach. So you must be able to handle rejection and be like Christ with that and give time and space. Space. I know, I know it's heavy. I know it's heavy. Let's look at verse 57. Verse 57 uh, states, as they were going along the road, someone told him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It's interesting when you look at this text as far as the, the Gospel of Luke around ch with chapter 9 that Jesus initially was trying to have a conversation with his disciples. Amen. He was going to do some teaching and, 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 and explaining to them about the gospel and about the kingdom. But as you know, Jesus was famous at that time. So anytime Jesus showed up, crowds were around. And so we see that there are a crowd, there's a crowd that's following Jesus. And, and the text speaks that they were disciples. Amen. And so this section tells us that, 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 that the disciples suggest that other priorities are greater than following Jesus. Y'all forgive me for my ebonics as it relates to this real quick, but I call this section of the text the I got us. The I got us. Some of y'all looking at me like, I didn't get it, the I got us. The I got us, let me say it another way, the I got to's. That's still not good for y'all grammatically, that's fine. How about I have to? I, I, I have to. Jesus, I know you want me to put my hand to the plow. Jesus, I know you're calling me something, but I got to go do this first. <laughs> okay, okay. Y'all looking at me. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Some of y'all in here are career-minded. Amen? Why y'all get so quiet on me when I said you're career-minded? Everybody shut up. Like, now you can't have money and, and work for Jesus? No, that's not what I said. I said some of y'all in here are career-minded, and Jesus has called you. And he's called you to be with him, to work with him. And you're saying, Jesus, I want to come work with you, but first I got to go do this career thing because I got to make money. I got to be able to support my family. There's things I got to do first. Oh, I said this in the first service. I'm going to say it again. Some of y'all, your I got it is a relationship, right? Some of y'all sitting here right now is like, but Jesus, I need a man. I'm talking about living holy. I got needs. Jesus, I got to. Y'all quiet. I'll keep going. That's fine. <laughs> The I got us. The I got us. Some of y'all in here are like me. When I was in my testimony, uh, uh, Jesus, I know you've called me to preach and teach, but Jesus, I got to go smoke a square real quick. This is a cigarette for some of y'all that don't. It's too holy in here. I got to. You know, come on now, Jesus. I know you said I'm supposed to be clean. I'm supposed to be blameless. I'm supposed to be working for you. But, Father, it's football season. I like to have a beverage with the game. I got to be able to, I got, I got so many other things to do. I'm, I'm double-minded as it relates to what you're asking me to do. I want to have Jesus, but I also want to have my cake and eat it too. I know that's not y'all. Being as gentle as I can. But it's true, isn't it? A lot of us, that's how we serve Christ. We hear God say, come follow me. And we say, I got you, but I got to do this first. Or I got you, but can I have this attached with me? Can this come too? It's interesting. Verse 57, he, he, he says, he says, uh, uh, I will follow you wherever you go. That sounds like us when we first get saved, right? That wasn't you. That wasn't, I mean, that's why y'all in here. You first get saved. Your heart feels good for Jesus. And you say, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do. What you want me to do? Lead Bible study? I'm going to start learning right now, Jesus. I'm going to teach Bible study. I'm going to go to choir, Jesus. I can't sing, but I'm going to get a vocal instructor because I want to praise you, Father, and worship you. I, I, I got to, I'm, I'm going to talk to the pastor. I got a message in me. My spirit is burning. I know you hear that a whole lot. I think I should preach on Sunday because there's some things about me that Jesus is changing. And I'm going to follow him wherever. He goes. 
And the master's response is, is interesting because he tells him, foxes have holes, the, 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 the birds of, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Could it be that Jesus is telling him his situation is worse than the beast? Fo foxes have holes. Even birds have nests. I think you can see implied in this scripture that he's also looking at them and saying, and most people have houses. But I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Can, can, can you deal with, when you tell Jesus that I'll follow you wherever you go, can you deal with the rejection that is coming your way? It seems as though he's trying to explain that to him, that following him means living as a stranger in the world because choosing Jesus is a choice rejected by many in the world. So we got a problem here. It, 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 it states that, 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 that Jesus not only was rejected, but that he's homeless. Uh, um, could you deal with that in following Jesus? The statement seems to imply that living rejected and homeless is to trust God and know that our home is with him. So let me ask you the question today. Are you in or are you out? This is a serious question because none of us want to look at Jesus and our walk with Christ and see rejection as part of the mission. None of us want to look at Jesus, and y'all better be real with me, none of us want to sit back and say, I will be homeless for you. How many of y'all do it? Look, I, I ain't mad at you. Go ahead and raise your hand if you're that committed. That's what's up. But think about that. Isn't it interesting when I'm talking about people that are rejected easier by us than others? When it comes to people that are actually homeless, that are still out there speaking the gospel, delivering the good news of Jesus Christ, isn't it interesting how we look at them, perceive them, and treat them? And there's a connection with Jesus saying, and I've been there too, but I'm not worried about that because I know where my eternal home lies. Hear that, people. There's a level of rejection that's coming. you got to be okay with that because you know who and whose you're walking with. Let's keep going. Verse 58 or 59 says, To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. This is a very harsh response by the father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, beloved, I'm thankful for my education and being in seminary because uh, there's a professor that I have that says, you know what, whenever we reach hard texts like this, the first thing we try to do is interpret it away so it makes us feel better. Right. We want to interpret it away because we can't see Jesus giving a response like this. But the point becomes when you see texts like this, ask the hard question. Ask the hard question that you would get to a place of understanding. And, 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 and it's interesting to me that he says, let the dead bury the dead. That is harsh. That's a hard statement. But I think the point becomes is that when we look at it and we research it, we have to understand that it seems as though Jesus is telling him that when it comes to serving me, I have to be your first and only priority. It seems to be that he's speaking of priority. So let me give you some background as it relates to, it relates to this. Scholarship says, uh, there's more than two points, but two points that I found in scholarship is this as it relates to the statement that Jesus said. Now, obviously, you can look at the text and it says, let the dead bury the dead. Literally, that cannot happen. Am I right? Now, y why y'all looking at me? No, I don't think so. What have you ever, dead people don't bury dead people. This is simple, okay? We don't, we're not going to make this complex. It's simple. Dead people don't bury dead people. So there's a, there, 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 are, there are theologians that think that obviously that's not literal, but it's rhetorical in that what he's saying is, is that let the spiritually dead. Oh, my Lord Almighty, let those that are dead already, y'all don't know anybody that's walking around awake but that's spiritually dead. Let the spiritually dead, those that don't have a commitment to me, those that don't have a kingdom component, those that don't have things to do in the kingdom, let them go ahead and take care of that act. It's tough, but it makes sense, and, and that's not necessarily where I land, but there's another uh, a level of scholarship that says that what was really going on here is the fact that what the guy was saying was, um, my father is not dead yet, but let me go ahead and take care of him until he dies, and then I'll come serve you. So it seems to be that he was speaking more of postponement. Y'all saying, mm, like you've never done that to Jesus, huh? 
Jesus has never called you to something, you said, hold on, let me postpone that. Hold on, wait a minute. There's some things that I got to take care of first before I can fully come and serve you. Let's deal with that ministry-wise. Some of you all know you've been called 18, 19, 20 years old, and now you're 50. And now you're talking about Jesus, I'm ready, I'm ready for my calling. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is, hold on, let me get my mess out the way first. Let me get my career out the way. Let me get my family out the way. Let me get my kids out the way. Let me get my addictions out the way. Let me get my mess out the way. And then when I finally feel better, I'll come and serve you. Huh, I, 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 I'll prove it to you because if you look back in the Old Testament as it relates to Levitical law, when it comes to burying the dead, especially parents, honoring your mother and father is a major piece in the Old Testament. So you would have to think about the fact that if, if his dad had died, if his dad had actually died, it would have been an ethical and moral priority for him to bury his father. Does that make sense? Here's the connection to that. Levitically, as it relates to the Levitical law, if you touched a dead body, you would be unclean for seven days. So it's highly likely he'd be out in public if he had done that. Just look at the text and check it out for yourself. Highly unlikely he would have been out in public except for the funeral. So it sounds like what he was saying was, Father, can I, can, can I postpone the call? It speaks to the, to the priority in your life. So I'm going to ask you the question today. Again, are you in or are you out? It's a tough text to walk through. Tough text to walk through. So let's go, let's go. And, and, I, and I see y'all staring at me. We're going to get somewhere in just a minute. I'm all good. Uh, verses 61 and 62. Let's walk this out. Verse 61. Oh, absolutely. Verse 61 says, yet another said to him, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Once again, postponing it. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let me say this to you, beloved. Nothing is to stop or block the pursuit of discipleship. Hmm. 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 It's interesting. Um, I've been doing this for a while. If I was preaching blessing, if I was preaching cars, houses, money, jobs, uh, you get amens all over the place. But preach discipleship and commitment. Preach rejection and time and space. Preach not postponing your gifting and your calling for Christ and people look at you strange. As if we don't all understand if we're in this house, there's a calling on our life, right? So let me ask you the question. Are you in or are you out? Are you going to be or are you not going to be a disciple for Christ? It's a heck of a question because he says he uses the metaphor for plowing. And, and, and you, under, you must understand it's not a refusal, but it's a warning. Amen? In the desire to bid farewell, our hearts never leave the attachments to old values and old ways of life. Let me, Lord have mercy. Okay, okay, okay. So let's, let's, let's walk that out real quick. So in the desire uh, to, to be healthy for Christ, to do the things that you're supposed to do for Christ, if you keep attachments with you, if you keep looking back at things, we, both, we all know you'll never let them go, right? Come on, let's, let, let's, let's deal with the first one. So it's just like if I'm telling you I, I, I'm, I'm looking to have better health and I'm looking to lose weight or whatever you want to call it, but I won't let go of the chicken wings. Y'all ain't never done that? Y'all ain't never done that? You ain't never had like the last time, the last time. You ain't never said that? It's the last time, Jesus. I'm never going to do this again. And the last time is the best time you ever had with it. You mess around, have some chicken wings? Like, this is some great buffalo sauce. Who made the sauce? This is fantastic. What is he, seasoned fries? I love seasoned fries. What you got, sweet tea and lemonade? Give me Arnold Palmer. Let me just have, because it's my last time, Doc. I ain't never going to do this again. And then all of a sudden, you look up and you're trying to leave it alone, and your mouth start watering. You're going, I can't, good Lord Almighty, I'm still attached to that thing. It's, it's enough ladies in this service for me to ever say this. I said this in the first service. I said, some of y'all talking about you going, Jesus, the last time. I ain't going to fool with him no more. 
I know I'm not supposed to be doing this, God. And I said I'm going to stop. This is the last time. So, God, I'm just going to keep his picture in my phone. Some of y'all got pictures of that ex right now in your phone. Sitting there talking about, God, I thank you for my exes. Jesus, he's still fine, though. He's still. Woo. And the attachment got you plowing crooked as all get. Huh? You trying to talk about you plowing straight. You looking at him. And you look back, oh, I done jacked up my garden. I can't believe I did that because I'm still attached to it. I haven't let it go. You don't need uh, uh, to, to keep it in your phone. You don't need to sit back and say, this is my last time. What you need is a clean break. He says, a man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. It's, 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 it's not refusal, but a warning. Stop being attached to the things that are keeping you from saying yes to Christ. And I know I'm not the only one in here. Huh? So I'm telling you, I, I, I want to be a, a disciple for Christ, and I want to learn him as rabbi and teacher, and I want to be just like him, but I also want a million dollars. So my problem is my career has me attached to the world, and I can't do what Jesus asked me to do because I look at church and say, church people don't make no money. Well, it becomes troublesome to you. Say, God, I, I, I want to live for you, and I want to do the right things for you. But, Father, as soon as I leave church, this is my last time. And this is Elder Annette, let me go on and talk to you right. Uh, this, 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 that's, that, that's been a whole lot. Some of y'all right now are sitting there in your mind, right? Right now. It's, are you thinking about as soon as you leave church, what you're getting ready to go get into? And you're sitting there going, I got to, come on, preacher, I got to, I'm going to serve Jesus. I just got to do this one more time, and then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to do what you asked me to do. I got a case of the I got us. Broncos, Dallas, I'm, I ain't going to hate on y'all. This is free church. And I the Broncos, that whoever you like, some of y'all right now are thinking about the beverage. You're going, this brother didn't preach too long. I got to go get my beverage, Doc. They've been on for 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy because while I was walking through this text, God challenged me with that. Are you in or are you out? And if you say you're going to be in, you have to be willing to have a clean break with some things. That's tough for us to live. Because then it looked like life ain't fun no more, right? Some of y'all, when I was in college, we used to we use a term called get on one. Excuse me, Pastor, for being, that's the hood vernacular again. Um, uh, or or some, some of y'all like to call it a buzz. Some of y'all like that mess. Oh, you see how quiet it got in here? Uh, mm, uh, I don't like no buzz. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, your silence is telling on you. All I'm saying is we're talking about being radical disciples. Your pastor has been preaching this for eight weeks straight, and if you are still attached to stuff, then you must be honest enough with yourself to say, I'm not willing to be a radical disciple. I just want to be a learner. Discipleship is not an emotional decision of a moment but a walk for life. A lot of us, when we come to discipleship, when we come to Jesus, we did it because we were in our feelings and we emotionally felt good. So you cried that day in church. So you wept. So you felt Jesus. You came to the altar. You gave your life to him. And 20 minutes later, you were still in a hucklebuck. Hucklebuck is a southern term for being in like a straight jacket. You can't get loose from it. I see the way y'all looking at me, too, because it's starting to hit home. What has you in a hucklebuck? What won't let you go? Huh? You get out that straight jacket, I bet you you can serve Christ in a proper way, and you can walk blameless, and you can walk with him. You can tell him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Why? Because I'm not ashamed. Somebody can talk about my testimony, but I can tell you one thing. That's what was behind me here. I'll help you out with it. In the book of Philippians, around chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, the apostle Paul says, not that I've already obtained. But one thing I do is forgetting what's behind, and I'm looking forward, and I press forward to, for the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. I'm going to let all that mess go. I'm going to forget it, and it won't bother me no more. Bring it up. It don't matter. That's part of my testimony. He tested me, and I passed. I got a good grade. What you want to talk about? There's a reason I follow. 
It's because I do want to walk with him blameless. You got to understand, good service requires loyalty. I bet your pastor will tell you that. I'm going to move right out of that. Uh, um, because Jesus, pleasing Jesus, is all that matters. The call demands absolute priority and obedience. Let me say this to y'all real quick um, so you guys can understand. A theologian said this when, when I was researching this text. He said, following Jesus is not a task which is added to others like a second job. How many of y'all have treated Jesus like a second job? Oh, I, this. I, I told God I wasn't going to say this, but he keep doing this, doing me like this. So I'm going to go ahead and go deeper. So some of y'all treat him like a second job, meaning he's not priority. He is just there to get you a little bit extra. Serving Jesus cannot be a casual affair. Y'all looking at me like some of y'all don't know. Yeah, uh huh. So then let's say it this way in an easier way, vernacular wise. Um, Jesus can't be a side piece. Why y'all gonna stare at me like you? Yeah. So then, you know when, you, when a person stares at this guilt. Right? It's, it's, it's guilt saying, you know what? And that's not what this message is about. I'm asking you a question. Are you in or are you out? So if I say to you, Jesus can't be a side piece, and you get mad at me, that ain't because of what I said. It's because of your actions. I'm treating you like a side piece. You're not the main course. You're just what I want on the side. You just make the meal a little better. Or you make me feel a little better. And we have to understand that Jesus is calling us to total commitment. He's not to be the side piece. He's supposed to be the main course. So as I close, as I close, as I close, as I close, let me give you just, just if you look at that, that, that metaphor for, for, for plowing, I think I did it a couple times for you, where in, in, in Palestine, it was, it was known for having a really, really rocky soil. So it was really, really easy for you to get off track as it related to your plowing. And when you're plowing, what you're trying to do ultimately is dig up the hard ground so that the seed is conducive, so that the ground is conducive for the seed that you're going to plant so that it has the ability to grow. Does that make sense? So if you're plowing, you need to make sure you're focused and you plow straight. Here, 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 here's a visual for you. I had a case of the I got us as it related to my marriage when I first got married, right? I know, brothers, y'all don't have to look at me at all because I'm talking about myself. But I, I got married and I said I was going to be committed to, to my wife uh, in sickness and in health till death do us part. It, it almost sounds like the way we should be intimate and know Jesus. I'm just saying. But when I was in my marriage, I was plowing and I would tell my wife, I got to go to hang out with the homies. I got to go hang out with my boys. Instead of being priest, protector, and provider, instead of being father and husband, I was saying, I got to do this. So while I'm in my marriage, my marriage is going like this. But I'm trying to get it to go straight. And God tells me, it's because you're not supremely focused on accomplishing that. A lot of us are in that place. We're not focused on accomplishing what God asked us to accomplish. So we see ourselves plowing crooked. And we're asking God to forgive us for that. And, and it's interesting because the way this text walks out, it almost makes you uncomfortable. Let me close with this. It is not until love makes us uncomfortable that we truly understand mercy. Hear me when I say that. Some things that Jesus will ask you to do that will make you totally uncomfortable. And when you look at yourself and you look at your life, you look at what Jesus picked you up from, you look at the mess that you had been in, you must understand that is true mercy. And it's our job not to reject somebody, but to give them time and space because we're in. Jesus is not asking us to do anything that he didn't do for us himself. So don't grasp for greatness. Grasp for a cross. So you can follow Jesus to Calvary. The question becomes, are you in or are you out? To be or not to be a radical disciple for Christ. I challenge you today. Don't be one that is stuck with the I got us. Don't be one that's stuck with I have to do this, I have to do that. But serve him faithfully and committed. Amen? Let's call our pastor up and then and, and bless you for the invitation. Thank you, Restoration. I love you.